Today's program is part of the award-winning series, Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter-Weiss. Profiles in Literature is delighted to welcome its popular guest author that we waited for a whole year from Great Neck, Long Island, New York, Johanna Hurwitz. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. Thank you. I'll introduce my Profiles colleague, Carolyn Field, Coordinator Emerita of the Office of Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm delighted to welcome a fellow children's librarian, Johanna. Uh, I, too, made my decision to be a children's librarian at the age of 10. What made you decide to become one? I lived in the library. Ah. It was near my home. I went every day after school. By the age of 10, I was practically a librarian already. <laughs> Were your parents involved in the book world? My father had, had a secondhand bookstore for many years. In fact, my parents oh. even met in a bookstore. Oh. And uh, then he became a newspaper reporter, and both my parents were great readers. So you, you have the right genes to, to write books and to read books. Exactly. And I suppose your brother and sister were readers, too. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's good. We would have not kept everybody who <laughs> Nobody <read. laughs> They didn't read. They were that's out. Right. Uh, would you tell us about the time when you were five years old and you had an accident and what the ambulance workers said when they came to your South Bronx apartment? Yes, uh, my head was bleeding very, very strongly. Uh, head wounds bleed a great deal and my mother was sure I was about to die so she called the ambulance and when the ambulance drivers came with a stretcher up to our apartment they walked in and they'd never seen that many books yeah. anyplace in a home and instead of putting me on the stretcher, they just gaped. And the one man said to my mother, gee, lady, you sure like to read. <laughs> my mother was you know, trying to hurry them to get me to the hospital yeah. before I died. She was sure. I still have a tiny little scar, uh, uh, but I'm fine. <laughs> With this background, it's not surprising that your first published work when you were only 10 was a poem called Books. That's right. That appeared in the New London Way. Right. Would you please share Okay, I have to tell you, I wrote it when I was 10. It took till I was 12 to get it published. Oh. You know, it's not easy to get published. Oh. oh. For me to read a book is still and always will be quite a thrill. For me to read a book is like a boy when he rides his new two-wheel bike. And when a bird comes north in spring, it's natural for him to sing. I like to read books of science, fiction, and mystery, books of poems, nature, and history. And what is more, I'll read until I'm grown, and then I'll write books of my own. Oh, good. Isn't that great? And, and I did. I suppose you were paid for this uh, little jam? Yes, 50 cents. Really? Oh, my. But good. it came out in 1950 That's right. when 50 cents was worth more than today. But not a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> At I, any I rate, couldn't it, believe it. it correctly prophesied that yes. you would become an author. That's right. Here we see you in your studio at home writing. Do you compose more on the computer or on the typewriter? Uh, nowadays, I do it on a computer. I wrote my first book actually longhand, and I couldn't write fast enough. I had too many ideas, and so I decided that I'd better teach myself to write on a typewriter. So my second book I did on a typewriter, and then I upgraded to an electric typewriter, an electronic typewriter, and now I actually work on a computer. So you're technologically advanced. That's right. Uh, your first book, Busybody Nora, was published in 1976 with Susan Jeschke's humorous illustrations. We see a sample on the left. Why did you substitute, or why were, the drawings of Lillian Hoban later substituted for this book? Well, it was really an editorial decision, not mine, but I understand it. The feeling was... I think was, a sample of hers is on right. the right. The feeling was that uh, the Susan Jeske pictures, which are wonderful pictures, and I mm -hmm. love them, but they seem to appeal more to adults than children. And it was the children's editors who had fallen in love with her style. And so the new editor working at the company felt that maybe it was time to give these books a new look with a more childlike 
type of style that would appeal to children more and so the decision was made to change. And the decision then was made at William Morrow Company right. which is your main publisher. Right. Uh, do tell us how you attracted William Morrow. I went down a list. <laughs> uh, my first book was published in 1976 but I finished writing it in 1972 oh. and then I would send it out and it would come back and I oh. sent it out and it came back and one day it didn't come back and that's when uh, the editor at Morrow liked it and kept it and made the decision. That was in 1975 and then it took a whole year until the book actually came out. I see. So you've, you've earned your stripes yes. the hard yes. way. I think most writers do. <laughs> um, the models for the main characters in Busybody Nora are this six-year-old and four-year-old seen in a 1970 photo. Who are they? Well, that little girl on the left is my daughter Nomi, and the boy on the right is two years younger, and that's her brother, Benny. And we lived in an apartment building, very much like the one that I write about in Busy Body Nora. And so many of the stories are based on things that happened to my children, or almost happened to my children, or could have happened to my children. But the setting in my mind all the time that I was writing these books, because there's actually four books about Nora and now I've also written four books about a little boy named Russell mm -hmm. who is a neighbor of Russell theirs and Russell has a little sister mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. these all take place in the same apartment building with the same group of children who are gradually getting older. I see but it explains the authenticity, yes. the yes. feeling of authenticity in those stories. Uh, your children look quite different in this more recent photo with your husband. What do your children do? Well, now they've switched positions, and my son is on the left, and he's in graduate school. He's studying computer science, and is very proud that I have reached the end of the 20th century, and I'm working on a computer, and my daughter is a social worker. Ah, that's splendid. What does your husband do? What is his occupation? Well, he was a college teacher for many, many years, but recently he retired, and he's very happily enjoying retirement these days. Oh, that's good. And... Do you have pictures also of a cat that we can see? I was going to ask you about uh, the cats. Do you, uh, there they are. There, the, there they are. Okay, those uh, are my cats, and the one in front is Sinbad, and the one behind is Selena. And everybody Selena. thinks that a uh, character that I've written about, Aldo Saucy, who has two cats, uh, has two cats because I have two cats, but what really happened was I always had one cat, and our cat died and oh. I'd written about Aldo having two cats and when I went to the animal shelter I thought Aldo's two cats get along so well I'm gonna pick <laughs> out two kittens and so I have two cats because Aldo does not I the other way around. See. Oh, that's cute. So uh, the, are your cats at all like uh, the ones in the, the saucy books? Uh, well yes they, and in fact you have to bell them? Do they go outdoors? They go outdoors. They have caught uh, birds over the years, which is a problem that Aldo has. Uh, one of my cats once got locked up overnight in a chest of drawers, and we didn't know where the cat was. And I've written about that yes. in Much Ado About Aldo, right. when one of Aldo's mm -hmm. cats disappears, and they don't know where it is. So you use uh, what they do for your book. All the time, yes. Well, even on vacation, you seem to look for ideas, and uh, you sent uh, a picture of a twig house to uh, Donald Carrick That's for right. him for an illustration in what book? Well, this picture was actually taken on Monhegan Island in Maine, but I wrote about little twig houses in a book that takes place in Vermont called Yellow Blue Jay, and Donald Carrick took this picture and uh, incorporated and, it into and one of his And used it drawings. in the book. Yes. Well, your book, um, Aldo Applesauce, was a 1979 International Reading Association and Children's Book Council Children's Choice Award, which is unique in that the children chose it themselves. And it introduced the uh, Saucy family, right? Actually, they were introduced in 78 in Much Ado About Aldo. Oh, was it, that, yeah. that was the very uh, beginning. Aldo Applesauce is better known, uh, maybe because that title is more catchy to children. Ah, and so uh -huh. it's, it's sold more, and it's... I think probably more red, but uh, in Much Ado About Aldo, the Saucy family lives in Manhattan, the way I did for many years, and then in Aldo Applesauce, they moved to the to, suburbs, to which New grew Jersey. out of my own mm -hmm. family moving. I didn't move to New Jersey, but I didn't want Aldo to move to Long Island because it would look too autobiographical, so oh, I sent oh, him I off to New Jersey.
<laughs> well, your your cookbook inspired a class in fourth grade class in Vermont to uh, make Aldo apple recipes. Okay, the cookbook was actually made for me by children in a school, uh, coincidentally in Vermont. Uh, when I went to visit and speak at that school, they presented me with a book of apple recipes that they had put together so that Aldo could have more than just applesauce. And they honored you as uh, author of the month, That's right? That's right, yes. Uh, in your, your fan mail, have you had um, many humorous stories from oh, the children? I get incredible amounts of mail, and some of the stories are very humorous. Sometimes it's a little sad. Uh, I got a letter just uh, about two weeks ago from a class and when I wrote back, I wrote one letter, but I wrote dear, and I wrote the name of each child who had written oh, to me in the class. Oh, wow. And a few days later, I got a phone call because somehow one name had been inadvertently left out. Forgive now, I'm me. pretty sure that that child's letter didn't come in the mail, that it somehow had gotten lost because it was a girl, and her name was Avery, and I think I would have remembered sure. an unusual mm -hmm. name like that. Well, the mother of another child in that same class found out from the operator my home phone number and called me. Can you and believe that this little girl had been crying all day at school and had come home crying because she thought I didn't like her letter and that's why her name wasn't included. So I immediately asked She's the so mother careful. to give me that girl's phone number and I called her at home. Sweet. And she was speechless oh. and happy and I thought if only one could solve all the problems <laughs> of the world with just a so phone easy. call or something very simple like uh -huh. that. But at least that little girl was made happy. Yes, and you don't know what that will mean to the little girl exactly. all through right. her life sure. to have had you call her. Uh, I know you got your ideas uh, from various places, but tell us some, some of the places where you get your ideas, from just, not just from your family. Well, I can even get an idea looking out the window. Oh, really? It, it's huh. actually happened. That one time I was sitting at my desk and I turned my head and looked out the window and a little six-year-old girl across the street had just gotten a two-wheel bicycle for her birthday and I watched as her father Actually, ran uh, up and down the street mm -hmm. holding on mm -hmm. to keep her from mm -hmm. falling off and reminded me of how I had learned to ride a bike many many years ago of how I taught both of my children how to ride and I thought little Russell is old enough to, uh, to have get a two-wheel bike mm -hmm. and then the wonderful thing about being a rider I didn't have to go to a store and buy him a bike. I didn't have to spend any money. <laughs> All I had to do was sit down at my computer and, and type out the words, and uh, Russell had a bicycle. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, one of your books that I loved was The Law of Gravity, which is such an unusual story about the mother who mm -hmm. has never left the fifth floor apartment in their New York City apartment house. Where did you get that idea? It does end happily, thank yes. goodness. Okay. But well, I remembered a mother in, uh, from my childhood, uh, a mother in the building where I lived who never went outside. And I always was fascinated by this possibility of mm -hmm. what would it be like if your mother never came to school when it was parents' visiting day, never took you to the doctor, never took you shopping. And so I decided to write about it. And when the book was all finished, I gave a copy to my mother. And she said to me, just as you did, Carolyn, she said, where'd you get this idea? Mm -hmm. And I said, don't you remember that woman who lived in our apartment building? And my mother said, she went outside. You must have been at school and you didn't see her. Oh. So it was oh. a good thing. So you didn't that know. Oh. It's a good, it's a good thing, thing that I didn't ask my mother uh -huh. before right. I wrote the book. Or uh -huh. I wouldn't have you wouldn't have had a story. Exactly. Because uh -huh. that, was a, that yes. was the power oh, of the yes. story. Right. Yeah. Do you have any uh, favorite character or book that, of the ones that you've written? You know, children always ask yes. me that. And I always say it's like asking a parent who's their favorite child in the fa family. You have several children yeah. you know. Uh, each child is different, mm -hmm. and each one is special in their own way. And that's how I feel about my books. Uh, I don't have a favorite. The characters almost seem as if they're part of my family now. And I sometimes feel as if, even though in real life I only have two children, that I have a larger family with Aldo and his sisters, uh, Karen and mm -hmm. Elaine and Alibaba Bernstein and Nora and, Nora, Teddy no, and no, Russell yeah. and Jay Kuda and uh, Lucas Cott. And there's so many of them. But the good thing is I don't have to go home and cook supper for them every night. Or buy <laughs> shoes for them. <laughs> oh, yes. your heart. Um, who are the uh, believable characters in your 1983 American Library Association notable children's book, The Rabbi's Girls? Right, that book is a little different from my other books because it's a bit more serious. Mm -hmm. And it's based on stories that my mother told me 
from her childhood. She was one of seven sisters, oh. and her father was a rabbi in a little town called Lorain, Ohio. Oh, and from the stories that my mother told me, I wove together a book, and when I finished it, the editor said, you know, seven sisters in a family, it sounds unbelievable. It doesn't, no one's going to believe this. So I had to change it and make it six sisters in the family, oh. but in real life there were seven. I'll be. And it takes place in 1923 and 24. I'd never been to Lorraine when I wrote the book, but I sent to the Chamber of Commerce and I got a street map so I could name the streets accurately and know all the locations. And one of the stories that my mother had told me a great deal about was a tornado that yes. took place in 1924. And when I read old newspapers on microfilm, I realized that this wasn't just something she was making up. It was a documented terrible disaster. Over 80 people were killed, many of them young children who were at a movie theater, and the balcony was torn off by the force of the tornado. And so I incorporated that into the book, too. It's an excellent mm -hmm. book. And though that is about your mother's life, is Once I Was a Plum Tree your most autobiographical work? It is. An awful lot of what happens in that book is my childhood. I did grow up in the Bronx in that same period in the late 1940s that I write about. But some things that I'd already used from my life, I couldn't use. Yes. For example, mm -hmm. in The Law of Gravity, Margot goes to the library almost every day. Yeah, right. And yeah. I'd written yeah. about that. that. So you even though Once I Was a Plum Tree is autobiographical, I couldn't let the girl in that story do it because I'd already written about of that. Of course. There's farce in Plum Tree when a young pianist thinks the book by Chopin is uh, about chopping, chopping people. Chopping, yes. <laughs> and as I want to know, do children generally understand your sense of humor? Well, no one's ever questioned that one. Uh, I suspect that some of my humor is missed by children, but one of the wonderful things about writing for children is that children don't read a book just once. If mm -hmm. they like a book, they reread it many times. And so I suspect that a child who may read a book of mine a second or a third time and is a little bit older each time will find humor and meaning in things that they missed the first reading through. Your 1988 Children's Book Council, notable children's book in the field of social studies, Anne Frank, Life mm -hmm. in Hiding, uh, is appropriate since your maiden name was Frank. Did the publisher, Jewish Publication Society, contact you to do this nonfiction? That's right. I had never thought of writing a nonfiction book, but I was asked to do it, invited. And the editor who called and asked me did not know that my maiden name was oh, Frank. Oh, that was And some so right. when he oh. asked, I felt it was meant for me to mm -hmm. do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it, yes. Uh, in 1965, I exchanged correspondence with Anne's father, Otto Frank, now deceased and with her friends, Neep and Ellie. When you and your daughter were in Amsterdam, which of Anne's friends did you meet? Well, Anne's father was no longer alive when I went to Amsterdam, and uh, I didn't know how to go about locating Neep, and I think I would, didn't want to trespass on her private life. At that point, she hadn't written her book, which has since come mm -hmm. out, and I didn't know how much she wanted to relive that very painful yes. period. However, when I was working on my book, I discovered right in my community in Great Neck uh, a gentleman who is the same age as uh, Anne's sister Margot would have been had she lived through the war. And his mother used to play bridge once a week with Anne Frank's mother and a group oh, of women. Such a small world. And I spoke with him and I said, when your mother and these women played bridge, what language did they speak? I knew the answer, but I had to mm -hmm. hear it from mm -hmm. him before I could use it. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, German, of course. Yes. And I was sure that much of the time the adults who came from Germany would be speaking that language. Mm -hmm. And when Anne's father writes her a poem and for her birthday and they're in hiding from the Germans, that poem is in German because that is his language, uh, mm -hmm. which is a terrible irony that he's oh. German, but oh. he's not German. Oh. Heartbreaking. Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh. So some of these uh, anecdotal stories that I got from this gentleman were very helpful in my writing. Well, tell us about your visit to uh, Astrid Lindgren of Pippi Longstocking fame before you wrote Storyteller to the World for Viking Quick Kestrel. Yes, well, that yeah. was wonderful. That's the other book of nonfiction I've done, yeah. and it was such a, a 
perfect balance to the Anne Frank book, which is a sad story, and Anne doesn't live to be more than, doesn't even reach her mm -hmm. 16th birthday. And I met Astrid Lindgren when she was almost 81 years old, mm -hmm. uh, having lived a very full, very rich life, and it was very exciting. Fortunately for me, she is fluent in English and could speak oh, to me yeah. in English, oh, since wow. I yeah. can't speak in oh, Swedish. My. Uh, and I visited lucky. in her country home right out facing the Baltic Sea, and uh, she told me every morning she jumps into the ocean and ha see it has a swim, yeah. oh. which is very impressive when you see somebody over 80 years old and you know that that water is freezing cold, mm -hmm. but maybe that's, that's the secret of her youth that she does this, and if you do it every morning, then it doesn't feel too cold. It's when you don't do something for a while and then attempt to do it. She has a wonderful sense of humor and very quick mind, and you know all the things that one feels when one reads her books are still evident, even though she mm -hmm. is uh, no longer a young woman. That must have been a memorable experience because oh, she is a one, wonderful person. Yes, yes. Um, you've done some other traveling. For instance, in Alaska, what did you f discover there that's a little unusual in the school system? Okay, well, uh, I visited uh, some schools in Alaska. One of the things that impressed me very much was that the teachers all had keys to the school building. If they wanted on a Sunday afternoon to go in and do some work. Each teacher had her own key, which I thought, what devotion, how, oh how fantastic. and. They took me in and gave me a tour on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, my book, Class Clown, uh, actually grew out of an experience that happened in Alaska. It could have happened anywhere, just coincidentally happened in Alaska, and that was seeing a boy stick his head through an opening yes. in a chair. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Stuck. yes. He, you know, he was able to pull his head out, but seeing that potential for getting mm -hmm. stuck gave me the idea for Lucas oh. Cott, who does get stuck. Uh, yes, he book. does. Uh, can you, what can you share about your current works in progress? Well, I've actually uh, finished a couple of books, but you know, it takes a year after I finish a book. And so I've done a new book about Lucas Cott and his friend Julio Sanchez and Cricket Kaufman, who's also uh, in that script. class. And the new book won't be coming out until uh, April 1991. Oh, mm -hmm. And it's called Schools Out because it's about these children during summer vacation. Oh, nice. I've also written my first picture book, oh. and I'm very excited about that. Uh, I can think, I know some people who've written picture books, and they say, oh, I wish I could write a big fat book like you do. Well, my goal was to someday write a picture book and have these wonderful colored pictures by some good artist on every page. And my book is finished. It won't be out until 1992 because oh. Jerry Pinckney is illustrating oh. it. And he's such a mm -hmm. wonderful artist, and he has mm -hmm. such a backlog of work that it's going to take some time. Uh, I think it's going to be called New Shoes for Sylvia, and it takes place in Latin America. Oh, a very different setting from very everything different. you've had so it far. Yes, but I made a trip to Latin America, and this book just spontaneously grew out of my experience. Uh, do you have anything to say about your uh, uh, illustrator for your books? Well, nowadays I frequently do get to select them. Uh, they're not people I know personally. I don't know any but, of these illustrators, but because I've worked as a children's librarian and handled so many books, uh, I am familiar with the art that's in books, and so I'll often send Xeroxes. You, you have a feeling for it. Right. And so Gail Owens, for example, who illustrated Hooray for Alibaba Bernstein and another book of mine called uh, The Hot and Cold Summer, was an artist whose work I liked very much, and I mm -hmm. sent Xeroxes of her work, and they contacted her from the publishing company. I've never met her. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Carrick was yes. my suggestion mm -hmm. yes. for Yellow Blue Jay. You were lucky to get him, weren't you? I was you? lucky to get him, and dying. I even had a chance to meet him after the book was completed mm -hmm. at, a, at a party. So yeah. I'm pleased to have met him and regret very much that uh -huh. he Well, I, I love uh, Diane DeGroat. I think I she's marvelous her. as yes. an illustrator for yes. your saucy story. Yes. I have a new book yes. about Aldo coming out. Oh, you it's do? It's called Aldo Peanut Butter. Oh, oh, oh the yes. children will love that. And love that's coming butter. out, it'll be out in September mm -hmm. of 1990. So how do you work with your editor? How do you get along with your editor? Oh, what I do you do? I have a very lovely editor. I've never had any problems. I know sometimes people have From problems. From the beginning with Connie? <laughs> Connie Epstein was my first editor, and we clicked beautifully, did mm -hmm. very well. Now I'm working with David Ruther at Morrow. Uh, he has a di totally different work style, a very different personality, but he's a, a wonderful editor, too. And very, he, he'll have suggestions sometimes, but he'll always say to me, it's your name that goes on a book. If you don't like what I'm suggesting or you don't think my comments are valid, 
forget them. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes what happens is that an editor will say something uh, or ask a question and make you realize that something that was very clear in my head mm -hmm. uh, but isn't was so clear. clear in my head that I didn't yeah. describe mm -hmm. it well enough or work it out well enough because it was so clear to me. And the question makes me realize it's not clear to an outsider. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing that an editor mm -hmm. does, not to tell you how to correct it and change it, but just to ask that right question mm -hmm. that helps you get to the right uh, what do you, solution. What do you have to submit to your editor now for in order to get a contract in a, in an advance? I suspect I could have called up David Ruther and said, I'm going to write a new book about Aldo, and mm -hmm. I would have gotten a contract. I didn't, because mm -hmm. that's not the way Connie taught me to work. Connie always worked that you sent in a completed manuscript. Oh, and although oh, David oh, has said to me, you don't have to, oh, mm -hmm. Connie taught me to work that way. And so I do send in a manuscript. But it may not be in its most finished state. But he has in his hand perhaps 10 chapters. You're unique in that, Mendes. I think, because mo so many people just send in a few chapters exactly, or something. Or maybe even just, or a, just an, outline. an outline or a yeah. page. But I have discovered that by not doing that, there's no pressure on me. That's true. I don't yeah. have uh, somebody hanging, you know, waiting in the mail for me to send in this manuscript that I told them I was doing and that I have a contract for and already received some money for so that I can then work as slowly or as quickly as I want. If I get stuck, I don't have to worry that yeah, someone's That you have waiting. the contract. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it really, then, you're working on your own time largely mm -hmm. right. because mm -hmm. your right. advance is just for right. a short period. Right. You can tell she's a children's librarian if she does. She's so well organized and knows yes. what she's doing and is well prepared. Yes. Wh when do you do your writing now? You're still working part time in the library. Well, I only work one day a week. It's just to keep my finger. Keep your in. Yes. Uh, I'm a morning person, and so I work early in the morning. Uh, by noon or 12:30, I'm finished for the day. writing. I'm not finished sitting at my desk because no. I answer my mail and uh, do a lot of other things. Uh, I might be correcting galleys or things of that sort. But the actual writing I do in the morning when I'm home. And, and do you uh, do a lot of traveling to talk about your books to children yes. and to librarians yes. and uh, It's parents? wonderful. All those years of working as a children's librarian were training to go and talk about my oh. books. Mm -hmm. uh. I love doing it. And when I was growing up in the Bronx, I thought, I'll never go anywhere. What a boring life I lead. <laughs> and the amazing thing was, by writing about my everyday life, I've been invited. Alaska, oh, Nebraska, Minnesota, Kansas, oh, Texas, California, Washington. I've been around a lot of places. Uh, these earrings I bought when I was in El Paso, Texas. Oh, that's my home state. Uh -huh. I didn't know. Well, they took me across the border, and I went to Mexico. Uh -huh. Yes, I'd never been to Mexico, and we just drove across. Didn't you buy and some jade in Alaska? No, but I bought some lovely... Uh, Indian carving, oh, Eskimo carving. Did you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Inuit. Where, where, where were you in Alaska? Just in the um, southeast. I was in uh, Sitka. I'm no, going to have to that far north. interrupt people. I'm sorry. We could have used more time. Thank you very much. Johanna Hurwitz has won Children's Choice Awards for the following books. The Hot and Cold Summer, chosen in Texas and Wyoming. Teacher's Pet in Florida, and Class Clown in Kentucky, Mississippi, South Carolina, and West Virginia. Popularity stems from humorous incidents, names, and illustrations in her books. Who else would use Russell Sprouts as a title? <laughs> in The Adventures of Alababa Bernstein, David Bernstein finds too many with his same name in the Manhattan phone book. So after reading Arabian Nights, he changes David to Alababa Bernstein. He even calls his friend Valerie Fishbone, Scheherazade Fishbone. We've enjoyed laughing with you today. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank being you our for guest. Inviting me. La -da -da. La 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 la